and sustainable development in Africa. This diaspora summit is co-convened by the African Development Bank Group, the African Union Commission, the United Nations International Organization for Migration, IOM, and the Sustainable African Continental Development Free Trade in Secretariat Africa. in Accra. This and several summit other partners. is co-convened by the say African in Development Codivar Bank, Aquaba. My name is Victor Ladukun, and it is my pleasure to moderate our two-day summit. To set the stage, I'd like to provide a quick overview of what to expect during the summit deliberations. One, while acknowledging challenges, our presentations and plenary sessions will be primarily focused on innovative and creative solutions that move Africa's development agenda forward. Second, we will be kicking off our sessions with short, dynamic, power-packed, and thought-provoking presentations by several global leaders who are on the forefront of critical development and investment issues. In their respective capacities, they also provide much needed thought leadership on how best to leverage the soft power of Africa's diverse and influential diaspora. Following their presentations, we will take a short break and return to several short plenary sessions focused on the key thematic areas of securitization of remittances, diaspora bonds, trade and investment promotion, research, innovation, and technology transfer, and brain circulation. Now that's not a medical term, but it's an economic term. In short, exciting and cutting edge, as well as actionable initiatives that have huge potential for being win-win game changers for Africa and the diaspora. The short plenaries will be followed by several parallel sessions covering the previously mentioned policy issues. Again, we have an exciting lineup of chairpersons and panelists who will unpack our key thematic areas. Already, you would have received links to all of the sessions to enable you easily navigate to your specific session of interest. You'll also have online opportunities to engage by submitting questions or making comments throughout the duration of our deliberations. All presentations, plenary sessions, and parallel thematic sessions will be recorded so you'll be able to visit at your convenience later on. It now gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Kevin Chika Urama, the Acting Chief Economist and Vice President of the African Development Bank Group to provide welcome remarks. Professor Urama, please welcome him to the podium. President of the African Development Bank Group, the Chairperson of the African Union Commission, the Director General of the International Organization for Migration, and Executive Secretary of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's really my great pleasure to welcome you to this 10th Global Community of Practice Seminar of the African Development Bank Group, focusing on development without borders. And we mean it, development without borders. Leveraging the African uh, uh, diaspora for inclusive growth and sustainable development in Africa. The GCOP policy dialogue was set up by the African Development Bank Group in 2020 to respond to challenges of Africa's development by curating collating and synthesizing solutions, policies, tools, strategies, and instruments that can be used to address these challenges in Africa by Africans and for Africa. This uh, today's uh, dialogue on development without borders is focusing on the sixth region of Africa, Africans in the diaspora. The Africans in the diaspora has achieved a lot of success in their areas of, of, of residence in several sectors of engagement. The African Development Bank Group, the African Union Commission, the International Organization for Migration, and the Africa Continental Free Trade Area is engaging <clears throat> to bring this African diaspora together and try to leverage 
all the assets under their management, their knowledge, their skills, their experiences, their networks, their <clears throat> technologies and finances to support African development at scale. I'm not going to spend time to talk about the teams because our Ebo moderator has mentioned it already. It's just to, to say that for GCOP dialogues, we focus on an African uh, fireside type of dialogue. So be very frank, all the discussions are treated under Chatham House rules. Let's be very practical, finding those solutions, sharpening those instruments, identifying those key policies that our countries need to take, our institutions like the African Development Bank Group, the African Union, ACFTA, and our partners can take in order to move this forward. Mr. President, your presence here, physical presence here, despite your many engagements, is testament to your leadership and support for finding solutions for Africa from every sector. The presence of the African Union, the ACFTA and IOM gives us a lot of confidence that this seminar is going to lead to outcomes that will be implemented to impact lives on the continent through the engagement of the diaspora. Let me thank our partners that have been working with us to develop this. There are so many, Mr. President, so I can't list all, all of them, but we'll have universities in North America, South America, Asia, and Europe who have been working with us to develop this. And specifically, Mr. President, your cabinet, Madam Lola Mabogunje, has really worked so hard to make this initiative come to where it is now. And so has, thank you, Mr. President. And so has your DG of cabinet, Alex Mubiru, and several vice presidents of the bank, directors and director generals of the bank. All the staff of the bank have really been so keen to see this come to where we are now. It is just but the beginning, a journey of a thousand miles, but I hope this is the first good step. And under your leadership and those of your peers, we are looking forward to a great conversation, key outcomes that can be implemented. Thank you, Mr. President. Many thanks, Professor Kevin Irama, for those warm welcome remarks and for getting the ball rolling on this global summit, Development Without Borders, leveraging the African diaspora for inclusive growth and sustainable development. As mentioned earlier, we have a power packed list of global thought leaders who are not only passionate about Africa and the diaspora, but they're on the cusp of critical issues affecting Africa's development. Joining us from Addis Ababa, please join me in welcoming the African Union Commissioner for Economic Development, Trade, Tourism, Industry and Minerals, His Excellency, Mr. Albert Muchanga, for his welcome remarks. Please give him a warm round of applause online and in the audience. We we'll go to His Excellency. We have His Excellency online. He's not connected for now. He is not connected. Okay, not a problem. We anticipate technical and non-technical issues in situations like this. Well, our next speaker, has a reputation, a good reputation. He sleeps and he breathes Africa. His primary passion is Africa. He is persistent in his pursuit of the best for Africa. And he is super positive about Africa now and Africa in the near future. It is for these and many other reasons that he is widely acknowledged as Africa's optimist in chief. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, the president of the African Development Bank Group, Dr. Akimomi Adishna, as he provides a short keynote speech. Mr. President. Okay. 
Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Your Excellency Musa Faki, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, represented by Her Excellency Dominique Zazabang Gamwa, the Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission, His Excellency Honorable Commissioner Albert Muchanga, Commissioner for Economic Development, Trade, Tourism, Industry, and Minerals of the African Union Commission, His Excellency Wamkele Mene, Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area, His Excellency Antonio Vito Reno, Director General of the International Organization of Migration, Excellences, Ambassadors, Heads of Diplomatic Agencies, Fellow Members of the African Diaspora, Professor Kevin Urama, Acting Vice President and Chief Economist and Senior Director of the African Development Institute. Ms. Lola Mabogunje, both of you worked very, very hard together on this. Please put it up to them because it was a lot of work to do that. And of course, when I got introduced by Victor Ladokun and all of you that are actually looking at me, you're all diaspora as well. I'm a diaspora as well. So we are all at home here. Uh, senior management and staff of the African Development Bank, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Welcome to this special event of the Global Community of Practice of the African Development Bank, uh, African Development Institute on Development with Our Brothers, leveraging the African diaspora for inclusive growth and sustainable development in Africa. The African Development Bank is delighted to host this event in collaboration with the African Union Commission, the International Organization for Migration and the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. Thank you all for coming and for joining us from around the world. Over the next two days, we will be looking to you to provide us with a roadmap and action plan on how to better engage with and tap the African diaspora for Africa's development. Your Excellences, the diaspora is not a dismembered part of Africa, but streams from Africa carrying precious assets that made their ways to become rivers, seas, and oceans that reach all parts of the world. If you want to know the extent of the ocean of Africa's diaspora assets, just watch World Cup 2022 matches. You see that for several countries from around the world, African players from our diaspora dominate, and actually some of them score against their home country. What you see in soccer is the same you see in basketball and athletics, where you see Africans in the diaspora gathering medals for their new nations of residence. Over the past 20 years, the number of Africans living outside the continent more than doubled to about 20 million people. The most significant number of African migrants reside in Europe, 11 million, followed by Asia, 5 million, and North America, 3 million. You can have an African leave in any part of the world, but you cannot take Africa from within an African. Regardless of how successful we are, Africa is our continent of birth, our source, our root, our identity, and our pride. Therefore, the development of Africa must be priority for all Africans in the diaspora. Africa that many left behind is changing, slowly but surely. Until COVID-19 upended economic growth rates, Africa had six of the 10 fastest growing nations in the world. Against all odds, foreign direct investment is rebounding in Africa, rising from $40 billion in 2020 to $47 billion in 2021, and to $83 billion in 2022, doubling the levels two years prior. At the recently held African Investment Forum with the African Development Bank and its partners held earlier this month, actually it's now last month, over $31 billion of investment interest were mobilized for Africa, 
in less than 72 hours. This investment interests are from over 1,800 participants, project developers, and investors from several countries from around the world. Now, what is it that they are seeing in Africa? They are clearly seeing a continent that is increasingly sure of itself, a continent that is self-aware, determined to extricate itself from the burdens of history and assert itself as an unrivaled investment destination in the world. The African continental free trade area will make Africa the largest free trade zone in, zone in the world in terms of number of countries participating with an estimated GDP size of $3.3 trillion. Africa has the highest population of youth in the world. That's estimated to account for 42% of the global youth by 2030, which means that Africa will be the right place and the right place globally for innovation and entrepreneurship and the outsourcing for skills for industries and services. Africa has 65% of the uncultivated arable land left to feed the world. Therefore, how Africa develops its agriculture will determine the future of food in the world. Across Africa, we must turn cocoa beans into chocolates, cotton into textile and garments, coffee beans into brewed coffee. That is why the African Development Bank is investing $25 billion in agriculture across the continent to transform the agricultural sector. Africa has an abundance of natural resources, oil, gas, minerals, metals, as well as extensive blue economy that must be rapidly industrialized. The future of electric cars in the world depends on Africa, given its extensive resource deposits in rare minerals, especially lithium iron, cobalt, nickel, and copper. Now listen to this. The size of the electric vehicles market is estimated to reach $7 trillion by 2030 and $46 trillion by 2050. Building precursor facilities for lithium ion batteries in Africa will be three times cheaper than doing so in any other part of the world. Therefore, the African diaspora should look to Africa for investments. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I saw the power of investments by the diaspora in my own earlier work in India when I started my professional career. In 1989, when I started my international career, I was based in a town called Hyderabad in India. I noticed there several mega hospitals in the city with their entrance hall filled with morale walls of names of hundreds of physicians, many of them Indians in the diaspora. Now, I could not imagine how they got to build such extensive and massive and well-equipped hospitals that have turned India to become a major destination today for global healthcare. Of course, I got my answer in 2017. Now as president of the African Development Bank, when I visited with Prime Minister Modi of India, when the bank held its annual meetings in India, he told me that the government of India provided incentives to Indian physicians in the diaspora to invest back in India with fiscal incentives, including tax-free status, repatriation of profits, relaxation of foreign exchange restrictions, provision of land to build hospitals, and many more. And when I pressed him a little bit further and said, aren't you looking for money? Why are you giving away all these tax incentives? He was very quick to let me know. He said, we just simply wanted infrastructure. We knew they would bring the infrastructure and once it is there, they can't take it out. Africa is facing today the same dilemma. The African Union estimated that 70,000 skilled professionals leave Africa every year. Among them are doctors, nurses, and scientists. In 2015, it was estimated that the number of African trade medical students or graduates practicing in the United States alone reached 13,000 
584. The Mo Ibrahim Foundation assessment in a report called Brain Drain, a Bane for Africa's Potential, found that, and I quote, in 2015, 86% of all African educated physicians working in the United States were trained in Egypt, Ghana, Nigeria, and South Africa. Just imagine that. Clearly, Africa must learn from India. We must put in place programs that support African medical doctors in the diaspora to connect back to Africa. I'm therefore delighted to let you know that the African Development Bank and the World Health Organization, myself and uh, Tedro, the DG of the WHO, had a side meeting during the World Health uh, Summit. And we decided to partner on what we will call Africa Connect, an initiative to strategically tap into Africa's physicians in the diaspora to invest in quality health infrastructure in Africa, including for the establishment of first-rate medical facilities. This will be part of the African Development Bank's plan to invest $3 billion in quality health infrastructure for Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, Africans in the diaspora are critical for Africa's economic development. The value of remittances from African diaspora rose from $37 billion in 2010 to $87 billion in 2019, reaching almost $96 billion by 2021. Yet, I mean, I'm president of, a, of, a, of an African development bank and we do concessional financing, but yet, Official development assistance to Africa in 2021 <clears throat> was only $36 billion. And that is 36% of what the remittances we got from our diaspora. I think you should clap for them. <laughs> Egypt and Nigeria are among the top 10 remittance recipients globally, with receiving $32 billion and $19 billion, respectively in 2021. Therefore, the African diaspora has become the largest financier of Africa. And it is not debt. It is 100% gifts or grants, a new form of concessional financing that is the key for the livelihood security for millions of Africans. Now, while remittances have helped to meet financial, food, educational, and health needs, as well as serve as counter-cyclical sources of finance and social protection. Much can be done to better tap into these remittances for Africa's development. We must eliminate the Africa premium charge on remittances, as the cost of remitting funds to Africa is twice what it is in South Asia. We must tap the massive opportunities offered by diaspora bonds. Diaspora bonds are effective instruments to harness remittances for the development of Africa. But despite its great potential, only four African countries have actually been using this. That's Ethiopia, Kenya, Ghana, and Nigeria, and with mixed results. Now, because the flow of remittances to Africa is high, rising, and stable, it offers huge opportunities to serve as collateral to secure financing for African economies. African countries should therefore securitize remittances to promote investments, especially for infrastructure development on the continent. The diaspora can also offer a lot more, of course, than remittances and investments. They have skills knowledge, know-how, exposure to the world of business and investments, science, arts, and technologies that can help boost the human capital for Africa's development. They can help to build world-class universities, and they can be mentors for the new generation of Africans. And that is why all African governments should prioritize the affairs of the diaspora. African countries should establish ministries of diaspora, 
to give priority policy attention to the specific needs of the diaspora, as well as expand the investment opportunities for them through special incentives. The diaspora should also be allowed to vote. I think you should clap for yourself because it might happen. If they can send money that powers their home economies, surely they should also help to decide the future of the economies in Africa. As Africans in the diaspora, you can look to the African Development Bank Group to partner with you on this journey to transform Africa. You have every reason to. The African Development Bank was ranked as the best multilateral financial institution in the world for 2021. This year, the African Development Bank was rated as the most transparent institution in the world by Publish What You Fund. This year, the African Development Fund, the concessional financing institution of the African Development Bank Group, was also ranked as the second best concessional financing institution in the world, ahead of all 49 concessional financing institutions in all 49 countries of the OECD. That is the kind of Africa we are today, an Africa measuring itself with global standards. That's what we are as African diaspora, best in the best in the world. Welcome to a new Africa. We are the same Africans at home, Africans abroad. We are the ocean of Africa. Let us together build the Africa we want. Let all of Africa's diaspora, sons, daughters, regardless of the place of birth or location of migration, willingly or unwillingly, flow back to Africa and invest in Africa. Rise with unison for the great awakening of Africa. Rise and rally around Africa. This is Africa's time. And in Africa's greatness lies your pride. Thank you very much and welcome again. Africa's optimist in chief and president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Akiomi Adishna. Thank you. Thank you for your very short, rousing keynote and for clearly laying out the tremendous opportunities that Africa presents for the diaspora, for the world, and for the continent. Thank you for highlighting the power also of the diaspora itself, because this is a win-win situation for us, and also for calling for the establishment in all 55 African countries of a ministry of diaspora affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Ultimately, as you've always noted, development and investment is a function of perception, of sight, of vision. So the question we're gonna be asking throughout this summit is, what is it that you're seeing? Because to the extent that you can see, it will drive your actions and it will drive your strategies. Again, Mr. President, thank you very much. We will now be joined by one of Africa's leading political and development figures. He has the responsibility of coordinating many complex moving parts of the African Union Commission, whose mission is an integrated, prosperous, and a peaceful Africa driven by its own citizens at home and abroad. He is none other than His Excellency Musa Faki Mahamat, the chair of the AU Commission, and he will be represented today by Her Excellency Dr. Monique Insanza Baganwa, the deputy chairperson of the AU Commission, who joins us via a pre recorded video message with a brief keynote address.
Your Excellencies, Dr. Akinumi Adeshina, President of the African Development Bank, SG Wamkele Mene of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, Commissioner Muchanga in charge of economic development, trade, industry, uh, mining at the African Union Commission, Mr. Antonio Vitorino, Director General, Internal Organization for Migration, leaders of global African diaspora organizations, distinguished delegates, de ladies and gentlemen. We would like to commend the work of uh, the African Union CEDO Directorate under the leadership of uh, my dear sister, Betty Mupenda, and wish you a warm welcome to this event. The commitment of the African Union to facilitate and enhance diaspora participation in African development is as old as this institution itself. As reflected in uh, Article 3, Paragraph Q of the African Union Protocol on Amendments to the Constitutive Act. And in 2005, the African diaspora was identified, and I quote, peoples of African origin living outside the continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality, and who are willing to contribute to the development of the continent and the building of the African Union. At the Global African Diaspora Summit 10 years back in 2012, the heads of states and the government committed themselves to implement five legacy projects on database of African professionals in the diaspora, African Diaspora Volunteers Call, developing a marketplace for the diaspora, African Institute for Remittances, and last but not least, African Diaspora Investment Fund. The priorities set out in the African Union's Diaspora Program of Action in 2012 are re-echoed in the themes of today's policy dialogue on leveraging the African diaspora for inclusive growth and sustainable development in Africa. This reinforces the utmost importance and urgent need for focus, timely implementation and practical delivery on those policies and programs. As you may be aware, the African Institute for remittances has been fully functional as an AU specialized agency since 2014. I'm pleased to inform partners that in February this year, the 40th session of the African Union Executive Council formally adopted the strategic business and operational framework for an African diaspora finance corporation, the ADFC, as the framework for the African Union legacy project on diaspora investment. Stakeholders and inter-institutional collaboration need to be strengthened in order to enhance our collective productivity in delivering practical results for continental development. I take this opportunity to thank you, dear partners, and request the continued and enhanced cooperation and support of the African Development Bank, the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, the International Organization for Migration, and other institutions for the implementation of the African Diaspora Finance Corporation Action Plan. A decade since the adoption of Agenda 2063, 
And for that matter as well, since the historic summit on the global African diaspora, we wish that next year, 2023, herald an era of enhanced implementation and operational excellence for African development. I thank you so much for your kind attention. Many thanks, Your Excellency, Dr. Monique Insanza Baganwa for those inspiring words on behalf of the Chair of the African Union Commission, His Excellency Musafaki Mahamat. This Global Diaspora Summit is co-convened by the United Nations, also co-convened by the United Nations International Organization for Migration in Switzerland. The Director General, His Excellency Mr. Antonio Vitorino, will be represented by Madam Mariama Mohamed Sise, Director of IOM's Special Liaison Office to the African Union and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNECA, in Addis Ababa. Once again, she joins us via a pre recorded message. Excellencies, distinguished guests, and colleagues. I'm honored to represent IOM at this very important dialogue organized in partnership with the African Development Bank and the African Union Commission to explore uh, the potential role of the African diaspora in promoting inclusive growth and sustainable development in Africa. At IOM, we are very pleased to see that this topic is generating increasing political interest, as well as growing impetus to provide innovative, sustainable, people-centered solutions, which is a whole of organization priority for us. Diaspora engagement has been explicitly included in the Global Compact for a Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration under Objective 19, which aims to create conditions for migrants and diasporas to fully contribute to sustainable development in all countries, as well as the United Nations 2030 Agenda and 2063 Agenda, which recognize the power of migration as a driver of sustainable development for migrants and their communities. These frameworks appropriately recognize migrants as agents of change and enablers for development in countries of origin, transit, and destination. IOM's diaspora engagement in Africa includes the Migration for Development in Africa program, the MIDA, which makes use of the skills acquired by members of the African diaspora abroad and facilitates temporary assignments for them in their countries of origin, for example, through virtual mentoring and support. One of the most valuable lessons learned from past MIDA projects is that active engagement and cooperation of all relevant stakeholders is indeed of the utmost importance. IOM has also developed a 3 E's strategic framework for working with diaspora communities designed to engage the diaspora through empowerment and creating an enabling environment, ensuring sufficient levels of protection and integration. Through this approach, diaspora communities are well-placed to benefit both their countries of origin and the countries in which they are settled. Given IOM's extensive experience supporting countries to engage with their own diasporas, and the more generally, mainstream migration into their development policies. Let me mention a few lessons learned on how countries can successfully link up their diasporas for development. Firstly, governments need to get to know their own diaspora. This starts with knowing where the diaspora is located, what their skills and capacities are, and are willing they are to engage in development at home. Only then can governments establish a mutually agreed set of goals to work towards and establish uh, diaspora institutions at all levels of government 
from ministerial to local based on those mutual priorities. Secondly, governments should focus on building capacity. To effectively engage diasporas requires sufficient and dedicated funding, building technical expertise and identifying partners. Successful countries adopt an inclusive approach. Members of the diaspora and the organizations representing them need to be brought to the discussion table. Trust is critical to the success of diaspora engagement, policies, and programs. And thirdly, fundamental step is to identify the mutual areas of focus. This could include remittances, direct investments, and the transfer of skills or knowledge. But there are other growing areas, including philanthropic contributions, investment in capital markets, and the promotion of diaspora tourism. Diaspora institutions and communities need to select the activities that have the greatest potential to impact the development. To do so, and I come to the fourth and last point, governments need to continually monitor and evaluate their diaspora engagement policies and programs. Successful programming is dependent on a range of context-specific and evolving factors. Monitoring and evaluating the impact of diaspora policies allow countries to adjust their focus and concentrate resources on those most likely to achieve the desired results. From an integrated perspective, diaspora finance, including investment, philanthropy, as well as remittances, have immense potential to contribute towards sustainable development in Africa and can also move the continent closer to ensuring that the human mobility becomes increasingly a choice. Migrants and their families become empowered as development uh, actors. Migration is increasingly well governed. To this end, I would like to commend the efforts of the African Union Commission through its Citizen and Diaspora Directorate for igniting the fire and mobilizing the African diaspora at all levels. This was particularly impressive during the challenging haze of the recent pandemic. The diaspora ways in which diaspora groups engaged with their countries of origin have been captured through a mapping study setting out the role and faces of African diaspora humanitarianism during COVID-19. IOM's strong partnership with the African Union Commission in this area is evidenced by the launch of the Continental Diaspora Engagement Framework. The framework's objective is to pool all existing tools, resources, and expertise, and make them available to African Union member states and the diaspora partners in a consolidated manner. Equally, I would like to commend the commitment and efforts of the African Development Bank in the promoting resilient societies, including the integration of mobile populations through their strategy for addressing fragility and building resilience in Africa. This strategy provides a platform for the establishment of vital partnerships that can catalyze the development of innovative, sustainable people-centered solutions. Diaspora engagement is a core element of the partnership between IOM and the African Development Bank. This has resulted in the development of the Diaspora Investment Toolkit, developed under the framework of Making Finance Work for Africa platform. But diaspora engagement will not be successful without the involvement of non-state actors. Civil society organizations are fundamental partners in improving public perception of migrants and migration, in enhancing the protection of the human rights of migrants, in assisting governments in mainstreaming migration into development plans at the national and regional levels. 
and in providing concrete evidence and recommendations for the inclusion of migrants and migration in the context of sustainable development agenda. Diaspora associations and civil society organizations as leaders of and actors within communities are well placed to generate and promote a dialogue on migration that is better informed. They can inform and educate their communities about the realities of migration, that migrant skills are needed, and that historically migration has been beneficial. But above all, the diaspora have a fundamental role in promoting the core humanity of migrants and the need for respect for human rights to take a center stage. We must work together to ensure that migration can benefit all. The Director General of the United Nations International Organization for Migration, Mr. Antonio Vitorino. Thank you for your insightful comments which once again helped make a very persuasive case for creatively leveraging the collective power, intellect, knowledge, and resources of the African diaspora. And thank you once again for highlighting the need for governments to know or to actually identify where their respective diaspora is located. The need for governments to focus on building the best and with excellence, mutual areas of focus, and the powerful role of the African diaspora working in a consolidated manner with the African Union Commission, the African Development Bank, and with non-state actors, particularly civil society organizations. Once again, can you give Mr. Vittorino a round of applause. This Global Diaspora Summit, leveraging the African diaspora for inclusive growth and sustainable development in Africa is also co-convened by a critical player engaged in the transformation and integration of Africa. We're now joined by the Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat in Accra, Ghana, His Excellency, Mr. Wamkele Mene. I'm pleased to join you on this very important policy dialogue on leveraging the African diaspora for inclusive growth and sustainable development. I take this opportunity to applaud the African Development Bank and other partners for this initiative, which comes at a time when Africa is confronting uh, the twin crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the uh, effects of the war in Ukraine. The contribution of the diaspora to Africa's development and inclusive growth is absolutely critical. A key point I wish to emphasize is that the diaspora has the potential to assist Africa to mitigate the development challenges of our time. If we are to achieve the Africa we want, Agenda 2063, it is critical that we further strengthen the links between the African diaspora everywhere in order to mobilize financial and intellectual resources for the transformation and inclusive development of our continent. As you may well know, the links between the African diaspora and Africa have grown over the years, especially so since the recognition of the African uh, diaspora by the African Union Commission as its sixth region, a decision that was taken in the year 2003. And of course, the establishment of the diaspora division within the African Union Commission in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, as a focal point to encourage the African diaspora to participate in the building and development of the African continent. It has been estimated that there are over 160 million Africans uh, globally, a diaspora that is eager to engage and contribute to the development of our continent. 
leveraging these millions uh, of Africans can therefore have a positive transformational impact on our continent, particularly from a resource mobilization point of view, as well as an economic development point of view. Besides acquisition of knowledge and skills, diaspora remittances surpass foreign direct investments and official development aid coming into Africa. These are only recorded flows. However, we are aware that the true total uh, flows, including those through informal channels, may be even larger. The remittances offer a window of opportunity for Africa's development against the backdrop of declining foreign direct investment and foreign aid. We therefore need to think more innovatively about how we leverage these inflows to assist in Africa's development, particularly during the current geopolitical context, which has been caused by uh, the war in Ukraine and the effects of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. There's also a need for greater accessibility to digital payment platforms connecting Africa to the diaspora as these are constantly more affordable platforms for money transfers and offer an opportunity for access to the market within Africa and of course, the market of the diaspora. The rollout of the Pan-African Payments and Settlement System uh, by Africsim Bank and the AFCFTA Secretariat offers us an opportunity to explore how digital platforms and digital payment systems can be deployed to assist the diaspora to access the market in Africa. The operationalization of the AFCFTA and the start of, of trading, which is to say the creation of a, the market in Africa, offers an opportunity for the diaspora to invest directly in Africa. The AFCFTA Adjustment Fund is a fund that is going to be managed jointly by the AFCFTA Secretariat, as well as Africsim Bank as joint fund managers. This AFCFTA fund is intended for investment, direct investment in investor investment opportunities across sectors of Africa's economy, including industrial, minerals, agro-processing, and others. Productive sector investments uh, will offer an opportunity through the AFCFTA for investors to see a return on their investments and at the same time to make a concrete contribution to Africa's economic development. To conclude my brief remarks, let me emphasize that through our combined efforts, Africa can, of course, overcome the economic de development challenges of the 21st century. In this regard, we acknowledge and recognize the very important role that the diaspora community can play in Africa's development. As I've just noted, the implementation of the AFCFTA offers an opportunity for the evolution in our relationship between the diaspora and those of us in Africa particularly in the area of investment and resource mobilization. On behalf of the AFCFTA Secretariat, I look forward to working with you, uh, the African diaspora, and I wish you very good deliberations. Thank you. His Excellency, Mr. Wamkele Mene, thank you very much for joining us from Accra and for those inspiring words, as well as the compelling need to leverage the soft power of Africa's 160 million Africans in the diaspora. Uh, congratulations on the creation of an AFCTA diaspora fund. Again, good news and a practical initiative moving forward. As the saying goes, the future was yesterday and we are already late. There really is much to do on our continent and in the years ahead to leverage the vast collective continental and diaspora resources that we need to create the Africa of our dreams, the Africa we want. The fact of the matter 
is that Africa is being transformed right before our eyes and for the better. Whether one sees Already the late. tremendous opportunities a transformed and integrated Africa presents once again is a matter of perspective. We're also joined today by several global leaders who continue to play very critical transformative roles in shaping the African narrative. Five of such leaders will now provide five minute goodwill messages covering the spectrum of the five thematic areas of this summit. Therefore, Kanli John me is a matter of a quiet. perspective, but highly effective champion of democracy, Her Excellency Hilda Suka Mafudze, the African Union ambassador and permanent representative to the United States of America as she provides the first Diaspora Summit goodwill message. Okay, I gather that she's not available right now. It is quite possible that we will be reconnecting later on. So thank you very much for the heads up on that. Up next to provide our second, or at least first <laughs> goodwill message is an accomplished author, researcher, scholar, and technocrat with an acute sense of Africa's development and economic pulse. He is the chief economist of the World Bank's Africa region, Dr. Andrew DeBalin, who joins us from Washington, DC. We're, we're currently hey, on the- Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Are you online, doctor? Yes, I am. Can you hear yes. me? There you are, loud and clear. You're welcome Excellent. to the summit. Over to you, the, the platform is yours. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, very warm welcome and congratulations to the African Development uh, for organizing this community of practice on such an important topic. Um, I will be very brief in my remarks. Um, just to set the context, as you know, um, African countries have hugely ambitious visions, uh, either in their vision statements or national development plans, or even just signing up to these global development goals, such as SDGs and climate goals. But as we all know, these goals, these ambitious goals require enormous amount of financing and new ideas. And given the current uh, environment, global environment of slow growth, high inflation, high interest rates, declining currencies, and certainly um, high levels of debt uh, for a lot of our countries, there's not a whole lot of fiscal space for them to actually finance these ambitious goals. That's why I think alternative sources of financing, such as diaspora bonds or securitizations of, of remittances are crucial. And I think African diaspora already finances an enormous amount of African development in the form of about $55 billion of remittances. But that's just the remittances going to households. Um, you can imagine that there's possibility for actually leveraging, not that, but even additional savings from this uh, diaspora um, community to finance these ambitious infrastructure goals, uh, as well as other development goals that, uh, that are currently under finance. So I think this is an important topic that is not often centered, at the, you know, it's not often brought to the center of policy debates and development in Africa. But I'm so delighted that, in fact, African development and its community uh, of, of practice were able to actually bring a spotlight on these issues. And so I'm sorry not to be uh, participating fully in this, but I wish you all the best. It's going to be, I'm sure, a very fruitful and insightful discussion. And uh, thank you for inviting me to make these remarks and good luck. Thank you, Dr. DeBellin, Chief Economist of the World Bank's Africa region. I can assure you, um, even though you're online, you are engaged with us fully, and we look forward to you being with us throughout uh, this summit. Uh, thank you for your goodwill message. Um, and again, just acknowledging from the podium the symbiotic relationship that the World Bank and the African Development Bank have in developing data, economic analysis, and providing guidance on strategic priorities for the continent. It really, really is a critical area of need. And thank you very much for joining us today. 
It is a pleasure to introduce our next speaker who will provide a third, or actually um, a second goodwill message. He is a senior finance and investment advisor at the USAID, USAID's Diaspora Engagement and Diaspora Strategy. In this role, he is a critical link between the United States, Africa, and the diaspora community. Please welcome from Washington, DC, Mr. Romy Batia. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me clearly. I um, want to thank first the African Development Bank for organizing this very important global diaspora policy uh, dialogue, and also for inviting USAID and, and our Prosper Africa Secretariat to share just briefly, you know, our experience and our approach towards diaspora engagement. Um, uh, as it was noted, I am the Senior Finance Investment Advisor at USAID, and I coordinate closely with our Prosper Africa colleagues, uh, and I'll briefly touch upon what Prosper Africa is. Um, I just want to provide some, in the limited time that I have, some remarks uh, on our U.S. government perspective uh, in terms of what, uh, you know, where we have been, what we are currently doing, and the, and the future that we envision on diaspora engagement for Africa's development. Um, so first, just a quick glance back to uh, what we have been doing. Um, from the US uh, AID perspective, um, when I first joined uh, the agency over 12 years ago, uh, it was to be its lead diaspora, lead advisor for diaspora partnerships. Uh, and that was during President Obama's administration. And, and it was at a time where we had wanted to make sure we were focusing on our engaging our diaspora, not just in times of natural disasters or humanitarian crisis, which of course is really critical for the the U.S. government to play a role where it can, but proactively to partner with them in giving back, uh, in the volunteering, in the investing, and and oftentimes being the first movers that diaspora entrepreneurs are in their countries of origin or heritage. Uh, and in our in our policy framework, uh, we actually develop uh, in partnership with the Migration Policy Institute, which helped us develop a roadmap for engaging diasporas from around the world. Uh, and this is back in 2012. And and then we defined it as the Diaspora Networks Alliance, or I guess you could say the DNA of diasporas uh, consisting of uh, six key strands. And, and for those that are, I guess, uh, joining remotely, I'll, uh, I'll just share that in, in the chat. Um, but uh, essentially what, what I wanna focus on is that you know, for us, di diasporas have played a critical role, not just in, in, the, in the development and the, the impact in society in America, but in their countries of origin or heritage, we know that quite well. And, and we elevated that uh, with the first Global Diaspora Forum that we hosted uh, by uh, Secretary Clinton and, and Dr. Rajiv Shah, the uh, USAID, the administrator. And that convened 500 global leaders and civil society organization in over 70 diaspora communities worldwide. And you know, back then, 12 years ago, uh, it was really important for us to find ways to partner uh, that leverage and harness the, the power of the diaspora. Uh, one of the first programs that we launched back in 2010 was the African Diaspora Marketplace, uh, jointly with Western Union Foundation and the Tony Alumalu Foundation and Echo Bank. And that was to provide diaspora entrepreneurs with seed capital uh, to over 65 of the 1,500 who had reached out and uh, wanted to start a business in their country of origin or heritage. And of course, a lot has transpired in these 12 years. The, the diaspora uh, policy priorities have taken shape for many governments, for uh, many multilateral institutions, and now, in fact, under Prosper Africa, which is a White House initiative to increase two-way trade and investment between the United States and African countries, it's become even more focused. Um, and what we're trying to do here is trying to tap the, the venture capital and private equity industries of the U.S. to drive greater investments into African entrepreneurs and innovators across key sectors. And you all might be wondering why the focus on entrepreneurs and investments. Well, it's evident there's still too many headlines in the news and in the Western media narratives that still focus on Africa and put too much emphasis on stories of disease or death and despair. And the fact that these stories often cause U.S. business leaders and investors to overemphasize the risk, both real and perceived uh, across the continent. Um, consequently, U.S. companies are missing out on opportunities to build mutually beneficial trade and investment partnerships across the Atlantic. And in fact, we see that statistics show as other countries have expanded their economic engagement with Africa, trade and investment between the US 
in Africa has actually declined or stagnated. Uh, so there's much we can do to reverse this trend. And we know that the African diaspora communities are often the first movers to overcome these risks and forge partnerships in countries where they maintain that strong affinity. And so to drive that investment and partner with the African diaspora, the US government's committed to supporting investment ready and trade ready firms uh, led by the African diaspora across the US. And to, and to learn about the trade investment tools, I'll encourage all of you who are in attendance to go to prosperafrica.gov and or follow up with me and can share more details about what that, what that looks like. Um, a great example of this is you know, an example of a US-based diaspora-owned small business, uh, Sebastian Institute of Technology, founded by a Cameroonian who is partnering with Cisco Systems to deliver digital and cybersecurity skills training in Africa. Skills that are incredibly important for the, the youth population that was just emphasized earlier in the remarks for Africa. And again, I will probably share some of that information in, in the chat for those who would like to learn more. Um, but I, I don't wanna overly emphasize just diaspora engagement through the lens of trade investment, uh, though that is where I focus my energy. Uh, the African diaspora represents America's rich history and diversity, which builds on the strong cultural ties African and American have um, that can be strengthened by partnerships, but that are based on equity, dignity, and shared values. And so we're continuing to conduct diaspora listening sessions throughout the United States, as we recently did in uh, the, our state of Texas, so that we could get outside of Washington, D.C. to know where the diverse African diaspora communities live, where they work, where they have an impact, and most importantly, where they want to engage with their countries of origin, origin or heritage. And after all, the, the African diaspora, like every diaspora community we are working with, is not monolithic, and neither is the continent. And I think our ability to listen, gain insights, and promote awareness of the different tools and resources that the U.S. government has amongst the African diaspora network is what I believe will enable us to really realize the, the Africa's true potential in this spirit of partnership. Um, the African diaspora is a source of strength. We recognize this and will be, in fact, highlighting their impact at the upcoming three days uh, Africa Leaders Summit to be hosted by President Biden on December 13th in Washington, DC, uh, with a clear focus on the diaspora young leaders uh, as a key part of the agenda. So I look forward to sharing some of our, our work that we've done on uh, diaspora bonds uh, later on in session today. But I wanna thank all of you in attendance uh, for your time, as well as your commitment towards uh, the work that we're doing to engage the diaspora for Africa's development. Thank you very much. Mr. Rami Batia, thank you very much. Um, again, for USAID's and the US administration's proactive engagement uh, with the diaspora and with Africa, as well as highlighting Prosper Africa and other platforms and initiatives that are working very, very actively in this regard. You also mentioned and highlighted the asymmetry of information on Africa. And I think that is actually very critical. And one of the reasons why the Diaspora Summit itself is all about shaping the narrative and showcasing opportunities on the continent. As the saying goes, until the lion learns to tell its own story, the narrative will always belong to the hunter. But I can tell you this for sure, in entertainment, in investment, in sports, in multiple spheres, the African lion is roaring. So we'll move on to our next uh, goodwill message. And it comes from an African scholar of renown. He is the Ellen Gurney Professor of History and African and African American Studies, as well as the Oppenheimer Faculty Director at Harvard University's Center of African Studies. In short, as an intellectual giant who specializes in the nexus between Africa and the diaspora, it is an honor to welcome Professor Emmanuel Akempong, who joins us from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Please give him a warm welcome. Uh, Your Excellencies, President, additional distinguished guests, uh, greetings from the Harvard University Center for African Studies. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Echampon, and I'm the Oppenheimer Faculty Director for the Center. I'm sorry that I'm unable to join you in person, 
but grateful that the powers of technology still enable us to come together today. The Harvard Center for African Studies is an interdisciplinary university-wide center that broadens knowledge about Africa and brings African perspectives to bear on the scholarship of the Harvard community and beyond. It is with great pleasure that I offer this message of support to the organizing partners and participants in this exciting two-day endeavor that seeks to explore ways in which the African diaspora can be leveraged for inclusive growth and sustainable development in Africa. Harvard has a long-standing relationship with the Africa Union and the African Development Bank through shared policy and research interests around business and entrepreneurship, good governance, and climate and the environment. Increasingly, these conversations are bringing us together in how we think about the green economy and the futures of Africa's mining and extractive industries. In October, we had the pleasure of hosting colleagues from the African Development Bank at Harvard to explore how our institutions could partner in the lead up to COP27. As an academic community, there are two concrete ways in which we seek to support the African Development Bank's initiative on development without borders. First, we are assembling climate and social scientists around Harvard to work with the African Development Bank's Africa Development Institute at Solutions for Africa's Climate Challenges and greening our economies. Second, Harvard University is meticulous in its keeping of an, of an alumni database. The Center for African Studies will access the database on African alumni back in Africa and around the world to, sit, to assist the African Development Bank and the African Union in our developmental agenda. I am excited that the conversations today and tomorrow will pick up where we left off in our October meeting and give thought to harnessing the power of Africa and the diaspora. With a warm welcome and well wishes for the proceedings, I thank our hosts and fellow organizers, and I look forward to the day ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Emmanuel Lechampong, for your warm welcome and for those reassuring words um, concerning Harvard's longstanding relationship with the African Union Commission and the African Development Bank, as well as your support in assembling climate and social scientists to work with the bank and with the African Union, as well as utilizing the very, very voluminous alumni database of Harvard University. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you for those warm remarks. Our final goodwill message will be delivered by a Senegalese French politician. She's a prolific author, a former minister in the French government and permanent delegate of France to UNESCO. She currently teaches at the Mohammed VI Polytechnic University in Morocco. Please join me in welcoming the director of the Africa Center and a senior fellow of the Europe Center Ambassador Rama Yadi. Um, greetings, everybody. Thank you, um, Dr. Adisina and uh, all the African Development Bank for having me today. I am uh, very honored and excited to take part in this uh, important gathering on behalf of, uh, like you said, of the Atlantic Council, um, a global think tank, um, well established and based here in uh, in Washington DC where i i run um the africa uh, the africa center the africa program and in this position um i have been uh doing my best um, to promote another vision um but maybe first a better knowledge of of africa because the continent is uh, is not so well known um even for by Africans themselves. Uh, maybe that's why I'm also a teacher, because um, when you teach, uh, you also learn. So I'm learning every day about my own continent where I was born. Um, and in the meantime, 
Um, I'm trying um, to be one of these lions you were uh, mentioning uh, to promote um, the, the true narrative about the African continent, not an optimistic narrative, not a pessimistic narrative, but the true story um, and with the tools we have. And that's the first, the first matter, the first challenge. We have to develop these tools to be able to tell these stories. Um, that's the first the first point. And the other point, of course, is to uh, to put Africa at the center of the world. And that's the, the, the title of my teaching at the University of Mohammed VI and Sciences Po Paris. Um, because Africa has always been the center of the world. It is the oldest continent, the youngest continent, and soon the largest. And just for that, because of that, this, cent this, this, this continent should be um, uh, at the center of all opportunities. And that's why we, we from, from here, from the council where I work, um, we do our best to promote uh, investors, uh, investment in, on the African continent. Uh, we are an institute of research. Uh, we also have um, a convening power and uh, we try to be influent on policies uh, in this very important hub where uh, not only you can find um, um, bilateral uh, policies with the US, um, an, important, an important hub for, for the African diasporas, uh, but also with the multilateral organizations. So, um, and allow me to say um, a few words about, um, about the, 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 this diaspora. Um, I, I belong to another diaspora, you mentioned it, the European diaspora, because uh, I have been uh, living in France for four years, um, and I, I, I represented uh, France as, as minister, um, as member of the government. And uh, in the meantime, when I'm here in Washington, D.C., um, I reconnect with the other parts of the African diaspora, uh, this old diaspora, uh, because I see myself like a migrant more than um, uh, a descendant of, of, uh, of, uh, of the slavery. And here we have this powerful African-American diaspora um, who really want, and that's my testimony, to connect not only with the other diasporas based in, 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 in France, based in Italy, in Russia, in Pakistan, uh, in Iran, uh, but th they want also to, uh, to connect with uh, the, the, the motherland. So Africa is not limited to its uh, ge geographical borders. Um, on the four corners of the planet, it's a whole dispersed population that today makes up this diaspora. And it covers several generations. Um, and it's, um, you know, in a few, in a few weeks, uh, Washington will host the, the next US Africa Leader Summit uh, for the first time uh, since eight years, it's eight years. And um, uh, as, a, as a director of the Africa Center, we'll have the tremendous privilege to open this summit at the African American Museum of History and Culture. That's a proposal we did because we wanted to use this wonderful tool this uh, sacred museum designed by a Ghanaian um, uh, seer, uh, David Ajay, uh, to host the first day of this summit and to highlight uh, the ties between this African-American community and the African continent. This is global Africa, and this is a concept, uh, a concept ignored that remains to be discovered. So uh, my, as an institute of research, uh, it is critically important to document uh, the reality, the diversity, the identity of this, of this diaspora, its evolutions, its history. Um, and as are the Chinese, the Jewish, the Armenian, the Lebanese diasporas. And you will see that um, this diaspora is, is, is probably one of the most um, complex uh, diasporas in the world, but one of the most important and promising because of this hybridity, cultural hybridity that allows uh, this diaspora to be really powerful and everywhere they are. It's a, it's a new reality that brings Africa to a higher level. And that's why the work around the, the African Union for the sixth region is so important. Africa has children everywhere in the world. It's an opportunity, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity and it is very, very important that actors 
like the African Development Bank, do what they do. I mean, their best um, to recognize this important population that is um, not only the legacy, but also the future of, of the African continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rama Yade. Thank you in your role at the Atlantic Council and on other platforms for telling Africa's story and for reinforcing continually Africa's role as the center of the world, as you put it, and for reminding us that Africa is not limited by its physical borders. You talked about a global Africa, I love that. And you also highlighted our cultural hybridity as a powerful and a new reality and opportunity. Once again, kindly give Ambassador Rama Yade a warm, warm round of applause. Earlier, we had some technical problems and we were not able to connect with one of our Goodwill um, speakers, but she has now joined us. So once again, allow me to introduce her, a quiet but highly effective champion of democracy, Her Excellency Hilda Suka Mafudze, the African Union Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the United States of America, as she provides our penultimate Diaspora Summit Goodwill message. Over to you, Ambassador. I think you're muted. Um, we'll go back to you in just a few seconds. Okay, there you are. Um, we'll give you a few moments to bring you upstream audio-wise. All right. It looks like we've got you. Over to you, Ambassador. Yo, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellencies, um, President Adesina, EU Deputy Chairperson Monica Zatanza Bagana, and the greetings to all and all Zebs. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. It gives me great honor to be part of this historic global community of practice policy dialogue, development without borders, leveraging the African diaspora for inclusive growth and sustainable development in Africa. And to address you, we commend our leaders from the African Union, the African Development Bank, and the International Organization for Migration for this laudable initiative of convening a global diaspora with the great peoples of discuss, to discussion, their active participation to sustainable development in Africa. Indeed, Africa will only be developed by its children. We have heard of lions who are supposed to be there who are supposed to tell their own story. And this is the work that I do here in the USA. To advocate for the good of Africa, to ensure Africa finds its seat at the center of the table of the decision-making of the world. They may be physically away from the continent, but their hearts are in Africa that we know. And always when we talk to them, that is what they convey to us. Overall, the African diaspora supports the continent in many different ways through financial capital, intellectual capital, political capital, social capital, cultural capital, and time. My appeal goes also to my dear brothers and sisters in the diaspora. Your contribution in terms of skills, expertise, connections, and transfer of knowledge is priceless. You are our hope for a better Africa of tomorrow, in which we are very strongly working on to ensure Africa finds its seat at the center of the table to make decisions in this world. Nothing can be done without the inclusion and the contribution of the African leadership for the world to take. You are hope for a better Africa of tomorrow. You have the tools, you have what it takes to uplift Africa, to create hope through job creation for your young brothers and sisters on the continent. We expect a lot from you, but as I have said earlier, I know your hearts are also on the continent and you will find it this is the most important issue which the leadership has come up with to ensure we develop our Africa and for us to be respected at the end of the day. 
we just have to tick positively what we call ours and they say to ourselves we develop we make a difference on what is ours the time is now when africa is making bold choices and critical investments in the regional integration process that will pave the way for the next generation of african workers inventors and entrepreneurs to innovate and, and thrive an integrated africa offers enormous opportunities in various sectors and the role of the diaspora is key, especially in emerging sectors, including digital, transfer technology, the development of partnership to support the transformation of the continent. I say late so rally behind this big project, this project which has been thought through, research has been done for quite a long time to make sure this becomes a complete solid in the, which we can buy in. I thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Hilda Sukamafudze for your goodwill message and for the excellent work you do in Washington DC and beyond for relentlessly pushing Africa's development agenda um, particularly in trade and investment, and pushing that to the forefront of policy discussions, as well as promoting mutual relations between the United States and the 55 member states within the African Union. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Once again, kindly give Her Excellency a very, very warm round of applause. While I um, use that opportunity to quickly scan my notes and go back to one of our previous speakers who I gather has now joined us online, if I can find uh, the details here. Um, just a second. Do we have another? Okay. Just a second, please. These things happen. Um, we'll now call on His Excellency, um, Albert Mushanga, who joins us online. We missed him earlier due to some technical problems, but he is with us. Ladies and gentlemen, we have left the best till last, so kindly give him a warm round of applause as he joins us. Thank you very much, uh, Director of Ceremony. I would like to apologize for being late. Uh, first of all, uh, we had a high level dialogue involving uh, the African Union Commission and the United Nations uh, uh, Secretary, Organization Secretariat. Our two leaders, the Secretary General and the Chairperson of the African Union Commission were in that meeting and it ended uh, quite late. And immediately it finished, I tried to connect. That's when I had uh, some hitches but eventually I was able to connect and I'm very, very happy to be uh, with all of you. And uh, uh, right from the beginning, let me say that uh, the African Development Bank and also the African Union Commission have a long-standing uh, partnership. And uh, as we go forward now, we have a lot of activities where we are collaborating and uh, we are deepening that process of uh, collaboration. One of the activities is very pertinent to this discussion or this uh, dialogue, uh, which is uh, development without borders, uh, leveraging the African diaspora for inclusive sustainable growth and uh, inclusive growth and sustainable development. This ties in very well with the work we are doing with the, the African Development Bank, and the, which is in, to come up with the, a study on the key drivers of Africa's inclusive growth and sustainable development. Uh, we have been working on it for almost one year in terms of preparatory work, uh, the concept of paper and other pro pre preparatory activities have now been completed. And we are at the stage where we are procuring the services of consultants 
and they hope that the study should be finalized by December next year. Now, when you look at Africa, I think the message you see or the indicators you see is that we have made some efforts to reduce the poverty levels, but there is still a lot to be done. And the, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, actually the poverty levels increased. And the, for us to recover, a number of activities need to be taken. But before I go to the issue of um, the study on inclusive uh, growth and sustainable development, one of the measures is uh, really to um, take advantage of uh, the once um, African market that uh, we've started creating, which is right now uh, the African continental free trade area. We need it so that uh, we can develop regional and continental value chains, as well as supply chains. Uh, the disruptions show that uh, for each region or for each country, there should be some level of um, self-sufficiency vis-a-vis supply chains. And uh, for us, I think it's better as Africa to do it at the continental level so that we open up large economies of scale and more make it more attractive for investors to invest in Africa. And when we develop those regional uh, and continental value chains, then we also embark on the production of intermediate goods from our vast natural resources such as minerals. So that the uh, African continent of Africa area becomes a market for intra-African trade in both finished and intermediate goods, as well as services. And in that way, we should be able to develop resilience to future disruptions or shocks. And to do that, we also need to really uh, come up with measures that would accelerate Africa's inclusive growth and sustainable development, and hence the study. Basically, what we are aiming at is to see if we can position Africa to grow at rates of seven to 10% per annum in the next 30 years or up to 2063. And when we do that, first and foremost, we bring together the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the African Development Bank High Fives, as well as the African Union Agenda 2063, so that they are fully aligned and we are able to ensure that whatever is done complements the work that we are supposed to do instead of having work being done across at, at cross purposes. So that's one of the outputs that are going to, to come out of that study. And in addition to that, when we aim to position uh, the African economies to grow uh, at seven to 10%, it also means that we reach out to stakeholders who can assist us in this direction. And the African diaspora, is very, very important in this regard at several levels. First and foremost, would I expect you to be investors in Africa? Right now, Africa is regarded as in a high return, but high risk investment destination. You have the task to really uh, end this because if others see you investing in Africa and you generate those high returns, the risk perception is likely to go down. You can contribute in that process. Then you also a source of skills. We are going to really require a diverse set of skills to ensure that 
we implemented this project very, very firmly. Because at the back of this, we needed to raise Africa's productivity. And a good indicator of our low productivity is to compare the Chinese population and the Chinese GDP with Africa's uh, numbers. Right now, the Chinese population is almost the same size as the, the African population, which is 1.4 billion people. And when it comes to output, China's output is 18.3% of global output. And the Africa's output is somewhere between three to 4%. And the discrepancy indicates the level of productivity between the African continent and China. So we need to really transform Africa into a high productivity economy. And this is where your skills are, 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 are most welcome. And with a wide range of skills, and certainly you can contribute to the process. And in the, uh, really transferring your skills to Africa, does not mean that you relocate. Those who want to relocate are uh, most welcome. They are, do, they are free to do so. But you can still transfer your skills while being where you are. There are various mechanisms that can be done you know, to, to do that. So we expect you to play a very, very, very critical role uh, in this regard. And coming back to investments, uh, I think there is a colleague of the African diaspora based at the London School of Economics who has been working with the, our diaspora directorate at the African Union uh, to undertake a study on coming up with the, an African diaspora uh, finance cooperation. Uh, so these are some of the initiatives which we need to look at it. And if there is need to align those activities, I think it is very, 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 very good. Because, like I said earlier, at the end of the day, let us act as one, let us move in the, the, the same direction, and if possible, let us move in the, at the same speed. The other activity which is related to what we are doing is to see if we, we can have a similar study <clears throat> on. In, uh, export diversification and export development across Africa. Because Africa is a member of the global community. We have created the African continental free trade area, but we are not closing ourselves from the rest of the world. We are going to engage fully with the rest of the world and hence the need for export diversification and the export development. Historically, Africa has been relying on the production and export of commodities. And the, the result of that has been a progressive decline in share of uh, a, a global trade. Uh, in the 70s, it was around 6%. Right now, as I'm talking to you, it's about 2.7%. Uh, and the, uh, that export diversification is anchored on the three areas, manufacturing, agro-processing, and trade in services. Those are very, very, very key. And here we expect you to play a key role. Uh, we have reached out to the African Export Import Bank, and we're also going to reach out to ANCAD, the World Trade Organization, uh, uh, and, and, and other institutions, and even the International Trade Center, to see if we, we can carry out a series of uh, uh, studies on this, so that it opens up possibilities for Africa to really position ourselves to increase our share of global trade. Let me conclude by indicating that um, a few days ago, we are in Yemen, uh, Niger, uh, for the African Union Extraordinary Summit on the, in, the sustainable industrialization, export, uh, divers, uh, export I mean, not export diversification, economic diversification, and the African continental free trade area. Uh, in that uh, meeting or the summit, uh, one of the key outputs was a commitment by the Pan-African uh, financial institutions of one billion US dollars uh, during 2023 for 12 months 
to see if he, they can use that money as guarantees to make it possible for national banks across Africa to uh, lend to the micro, small, and medium enterprises. Because the enduring problem they first is uh, the lack of access to finance. We hope that can be done. And uh, I mean, that, right. that, that, that's um, one minute to wrap up just for reasons yes. of time. Thank yes, it's the last one. Yes. So we hope that uh, that is going to be done. And uh, again, we look uh, to the African diaspora to link up with us so that uh, we can work on this program, which eventually also aims to uh, contribute to what the African Development Bank is already doing. And this is to formalize the informal sector. So once again, I apologize for coming late and thank you for the opportunity to address you. Thank you very much. I yield the floor. His Excellency, Mr. Albert Muchanga, the Commissioner for Economic Development, Trade, Tourism, Industry and Minerals with the African Union Commission. Thank you for reminding us of the need to focus on strengthening integration value chains and inclusive growth, as well as reducing the risks of uh, investment, um, or rather the, the, the reducing the risk perceptions by diasporans investing on the continent, as well as connecting with one of our earlier speakers, uh, Ambassador Ramayade earlier, who talked about cultural hybridity and the need to lend, for the diaspora to lend its skills to Africa where it is, a powerful combination and a powerful force. Well, at this point, we're gonna take a short 20 minute break. And when we return, we'll have a plenary discussion on the five thematic issues of securitization of remittances, diaspora bonds, trade and investment promotion, research, innovation, knowledge and technology transfer, and the non-medical theme of brain circulation. I love that. I'm just going to hang around for that particular session. I don't know what you're going to join in on, but that's mine uh, today. This will be followed by facilitated discussions from the floor and online. Once again, before we go on a break, as I promised at the beginning, we really have a power-packed uh, roster of global thought leaders who are not just shaping the narrative on Africa, but making a significant uh, contribution to its transformation. We have heard from them and we have a whole lot more coming up after the break. So for now, I'd like for you once again to kindly give each of our speakers and panelists a warm round of applause. <laughs> Take a short break and we'll see you in 20 minutes. For now, we'll have a group photograph, a family photograph for those who are in the audience. And I think that we should also use the opportunity to capture online, uh, take a family photograph of those who are online also. But for those who are in the auditorium here at the African Development Bank headquarters in Abidjan, we'll veer to the right or to your left uh, for the family photograph immediately following. See you in 20 minutes. Once again, thank you very much.
To all of our delegates and speakers joining us from across the world, from Asia, across Africa, Europe, North and South America, and the Caribbean, welcome to the Global Summit, or welcome back to the Global Summit on Development Without Borders, leveraging the African diaspora for inclusive growth and sustainable development in Africa. 
I do trust that you've had a good lunch or a good break. Um, again, we had a fantastic uh, first session and we're gonna move on very quickly to our second session, which will round out uh, the activities for today and set the stage for even much more robust conversations uh, tomorrow. The summit is convened by the African Development Bank Group, the African Union Commission, the United Nations International Organization for Migration, IOM, the Africa Continental Free Trade Secretariat in Accra, and several other partners who we are truly indebted to. During this next session, five speakers will speak again for five minutes each and explore the five thematic areas of the summit and provide actionable solutions within each specific area. Joining us, first of all, from the UK to provide our first intervention on the securitization of remittances is the director of GK Partners, a visiting professor in practice at the London School of Economics and Political Science, LSE, and a UK African Union Commission lead consultant on diaspora and innovative finance. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jibril Fal. The platform thank is yours. You. Uh, thank you so much. And my excuse is for any background noise. I've just been moved from one place to another in Barcelona. I'm going to pick up from where the Deputy um, Commissioner of the African Union um, left it in relation to the announcement that in February of this year, the African Union endorsed the African Diaspora Finance Corporation as the framework within which to pursue its legacy project on diaspora finance. The approach of ADFC is to look at remittances and other forms of African financial resources in a holistic approach. Thus, securitization of remittances, the flows of remittances themselves, diaspora bonds, diaspora mutual funds are all approached as something that ADFC should be able to pursue together with its partners. I had the good fortune to be working with the African Union to do the study, the research, the consultations from 2018 onwards to produce the framework that we have. Now, I would make a number of observations on both securitization of remittances and on diaspora bonds. Because as I've just mentioned, the two and the other forms of diaspora finance, as it were, are interlinked. And from the African Union point of view, they are not separated as we, have, we are doing in this workshop. In relation to remittances, as we know, as we speak now, the inflows to Africa is about 100, 100 billion a year, 96 billion in 2011. My study in 2018-19, at that time, the formal flows was at 82 billion. But my study um, found out that it was actually more like 200 billion because the 86, 82 billion or the 100 billion now does not count not only in formal remittances, but also what we call remittances in kind, whereby someone in Africa may want to start a business and they have member of family or friend who's supporting them. Instead of sending only cars, they send them the equipment as well. That equipment towards the business venture or the project, those things are not counted by the numbers. So you have perhaps 200 billion coming into the country with all the benefit it has on the economy locally. But what can you do with it? Three possible things. One thing has already been done for about 15, 10 years ago. It is now possible for African countries to use this expected inflow of hard currency. And it is almost, it, it's a solid expectation. It not only does it come in ear in ear out, it increases. So that can be used to increase the credit worthiness, the sovereign credit worthiness 
of African member states. But this is currently underutilized. And there are African countries who do not even have sovereign credit rating, and yet they have a major inflow. The Gambia, as an example, I'm from the Gambia, and they receive nearly 700 million um, remittances, dollars in remittances of last year, and the country does not have credit rating. So that can be a significant part. Second is how do you securitize these known inflows in order to leverage against debt? Afraxim Bank has been a pioneer, having tried this some 15 years ago. But again, the facilities was underutilized, partly because of the problems. The inflow of these big sums do not come as a lump sum to an individual. So it cannot necessarily be securitized for the government or for an institution. So the mechanism used is the two that has been done before was money gram inflows or Western Union inflows to a financial institution. Because the financial institution, say a bank can say, I expect X millions to come through remittances through the year and I can prove that I've been getting it. So in that sense, it can be securitized within that context. And the third item around the securitization of, of, of the flows is what at the ADFC would be our first um, operational point, that is remittance match funding as a form of innovative finance. Imagine if a percentage of these 100 million that is 100 billion that's coming from um, formal sources. Imagine if a percentage of that was much funded by the governments of the countries from which these monies are coming from, mainly Europe, North America, and parts of Asia. Then that can form a form of innovative finance fund which can be used for a whole list of activities. And for the purposes of ADFC, the idea is you create a pool of funding, and that would be a legacy endowment fund invested in Africa. The reason why um, host countries of the African diaspora may want to do that is because by the time they send their remittances, they've already paid taxes on it. And it's a sort of tax rebate which many countries in Europe and America have those facilities to give back the tax rebate for what would be considered contributions towards sustainable development. The difference here with ADFC is that the rebate will be a match fund, not going back to the individual remitter, but to a pool at the ADFC. The funds are pooled together and they are treated as an endowment fund. That is, they would be managed and invested with African financial institutions, and the income from it is what would be disbursed. That way, one would create for the first time a diaspora or migrant-related legacy, perpetual legacy fund. And Chair, if you allow me to just spend a couple of minutes on the other part, which is the diaspora bonds. Regarding the diaspora bonds, ADFC's um, priorities on that are to say the standard model of a diaspora bond in the form of a global bond issued by the sovereign African country, maybe in New York or in London, is in practice not suitable for many African countries. This is why we would hear from Mr. Kazim Bello later on this. This is why in practice, there is more talk and act than action. And of the countries that have tried it, several actually failed till we had the success with Nigeria. So what we're saying at ADFC is, you do what we're beginning to call diaspora targeted bonds. So keep the current structures in African countries that know how to borrow and know how to pay back through the local borrowing mechanisms. To use that mechanism, only you target the African diaspora. And in this case, not just the first generation migrants, but the multi-generational diaspora and the older diaspora to invest in these local bond structures. These local bond structures, denominated in local currency. So there's no problems of Forex. 
we have done the studies in sample countries like um, Gambia and Sierra Leone to show Professor, that the diaspora, give you 60 seconds. Yes, the diaspora who would be pleased to invest in these local structured bonds will do it because it's a form of remittance substitution. They send their hard currency dollars. They do not expect to convert their income to be repatriated. No, they see it so as local earnings for their local expenses. And can I take this opportunity to say, and we would send the invitation to everybody, that the African Union Commission with the London School of Economics and other partners are convening a whole day of consultations and discussions on this very matter on the 26th of January, um, 2023, through the good offices of the African Development Bank, we will share this link with all of you. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Can I give Professor Jibril Fall a warm, warm round of applause there. Thank you very much, Professor, uh, for your insightful and immense contributions on the securitization of remittances and wishing you all the very best um, with the uh, conference coming up in January. Uh, we look forward to receiving additional information on that. Thank you again for highlighting the fact that remittances in Africa have grown since 2019, 2020, when they were about 86 billion to about 100 billion in 2021. You've shared the need for leveraging sub the sovereign credit worthiness of nations based on inflows. Uh, we've talked about remittance match funding by Europe, Asia, and North America, and treating these funds as endowment funds, as well as creating a diaspora targeted bond. Fantastic contributions, excellent ideas, moving the agenda forward. To discuss and provide an intervention on diaspora bonds, which is taking what Professor Jibril has just talked about, taking it another step further, um, is the co-founder and CEO of the Capital and Equity Fund Limited and an executive director with Afric Capital and Equity Funds, Dr. Kazim Belo, who joins us from the United States. Please give Dr. Kazim Belo a warm, warm welcome and a round of applause here. Thank you. Dr. Belo, thanks for joining us. Yes, um, good afternoon in Africa and a good morning um, in the United States continent of um, Americas and then um, good evening in Asia. Thank you, Mr. Vito. Uh, I want to observe all the published calls. Uh, I'm very brief. Um, much of what we are deliberating upon today has been highlighted by speakers and uh, including uh, the elder that just spoke. Uh, I, I think what we're going to have to is going to be a little bit Mr. Bello. Um, the main Mr. Bello, just hold on a second. Hear me? No, just hold on a second. Um, Can you hear me? Um, no, we cannot. Let what we're going to do, okay. we're, going to, we're going to move on to the next speaker in a moment. That will give you an opportunity to um, improve. Hello? Yes, I'd like for you to um, either improve the quality of your internet connection or move to a location where you could be better received. But now uh, the the audio quality is not that great. So we're only catching bits and pieces of what it is that you're saying. So we're gonna come back to you in a moment, just work on the audio quality of your connection. We can see you, but we'll come back to you in just a few moments. So we're gonna move on and um, go on to our next speaker and then come back to Mr. Kazim Bello in just a few moments. Now, if you've been around the halls and the hallways of Washington DC and even beyond that, our next thematic speaker on trade and investment has for decades been a passionate advocate for trade and investment between the United States, Africa, and the diaspora. He talks and he walks the walk. Please welcome the president and CEO of Constituency for Africa, Mr. Melvin Foote. Over to you. Melvin, are you online? It doesn't look like that is the case. Um, can somebody work to ensure that uh, Melvin can join us? And if not, we're gonna come back to 
Mr. Bello, trusting that again, we have much improved connectivity on his end. Mr. Kazim Bello, we're gonna come back to you. Um, are you still online and do you have a better connection? Yes, I'm online. Okay. All right, so let's go back to you. And then by the time you're done, we most likely will have Melvin Foote um, online. Thank you. Yes, um, can you hear me clear now? Yes, yes we can. Okay, great. Um, the presentation is gonna be, the main deck presentation is gonna be going to um, the, the breakout uh, session. It doesn't look like this is going to work. Um, kindly work with us and we'll work with you. Um, if you could find an alternative to link up, that would be much appreciated. We want to get the full value of what it is that you have to offer us at this point. So we'll, again, we'll try and come back uh, to you. We do apologize. So hear me now. No, we cannot hear you properly. So we're gonna have to come back to you later and preferably find a location you have a much better connectivity. Um, okay, let, me, let, me switch, let me switch my device. My device. Okay. okay, we'll give you a few seconds to, to do that. And um, if you have to improve connectivity, we'll come to you. But I think you're gonna to have to turn off one of your devices. Hello. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, I just switched the device. I probably have a connection in the office. Hello? Okay, uh, please go ahead. Okay, very good. So um, the, the current presentation, like I said, we focus on African diaspora bond as a vehicle to promote African-based capital formation and outlets for grow to grow small scale businesses across the continent as a vehicle for poverty elevation and sustainable development. Um, the, the goal here is let's ask ourselves this question. Um, what we are doing is a value proposition and we are looking for an outcome. This conference goal is to look for an outcome as a solution. What we'd like to do, we'd really like to maximize the time that we have right now. So you've got five minutes yes. and we'd like to hit on actionable uh, points very, very quickly. Yes, that's Thank what I'm, that's what I would do. That's what I would do. The, the actionable plan as we see is what we would know. We know that we have remittances in Africa. We also know that uh, Africa will be short of capital inflow. We also know that we need to tackle poverty in Africa. So the actionable plan that we are proposing, which we have I said, like I said, is gonna be presented to the breakout session. We focus on creating an African diaspora bond. The last uh, speaker, Professor, actually mentioned that there's a synchronization between um, the secularization and African diaspora, which I agree with him totally. The, effort, the effect of having a synchronization is we can actually secularize African remittances and create a diaspora bond. And in doing so, we will be able to allow African and diaspora to participate in the development and economic growth in Africa. Now, what are the, the kind of value that we need is a specific diaspora bond to tackle. We should focus on a diaspora bond that will target small case industries, small businesses, so that it will have a multiplier effect on transforming employment and generating income for teaming population in Africa. And of course, we have already alerted the benefit. I'm not gonna go into that. We have already alerted the benefit of a diaspora bond, but like we asked, we have like we have rightly said, what are the value proposition here? We want a bond. If we can create an African-based bond, it is not a rocket science. It is what we can do, and it has been done elsewhere. 
and it has been attempted in Africa. We should have a low per value bond that many African in diaspora can subscribe to. It should be also a multiple open-ended bond. And we should also have a bond that is callable, redeemable, and transferable. All these features are things that we would discuss. Mr. Bello, I'm, I'm, Mr. Bello, I'm, going, to, I'm going to play the angel's advocate here. I think that um, with regards to the creation of a bond, we're already, we're all agreed on the need, the necessity for such a bond. What are the things that have stood in the way of that happening? And what is it that you're proposing? If you could hire, if you could use the next two minutes to give us some insights on that before we get in, before we dig deeper during the um, uh, plenary sessions, that would be much appreciated. I think we're, okay. we're all agreed okay. on the need for no, the bond. No, nothing, nothing will stand in our way to create a, a similar bond. Again, we are not inventing the wheel here. We just had African Development Bank uh, created an euro bond for social economic development in Africa. We can take that template to develop an African, develop, African diaspora bond that we assist all African diaspora to participate or whoever the investor. The issue here is that we should look at a non-market-based bond so that it can attract the diaspora remittances that we are talking about. So we are not, again, we are not inventing the wheel. And I would like to stop here. Again, most of what um, is contained in my deck to the, to the AFC will be submitted to the breakout session. And then a bond can be created. We can manage it. We can sustain it. And we can use it to leverage capital formation in Africa. And, to, and reduce poverty. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Bello. Um, I, I just want to say that I know that you're very, very upbeat about the diaspora bonds, and um, I want to thank you for what you're doing in this regard, pushing the agenda and working towards its creation. Thank you very much for joining us. Please hold on with us because shortly um, afterwards, we're going to be uh, deep diving into some of the upcoming uh, plenary sessions. So for now, um, I'm gonna try and see if Melvin Foote has joined us online. As I said earlier, uh, if you've walked the halls of Washington DC for any length of time, it is very likely that you would have run into Melvin. He is passionate about Africa, trade and investment between Africa, the diaspora, and the African continent. He talks the talk and he walks the walk. It is great to have him with us right now. Uh, we're gonna go straight to Melvin Foote for his intervention. Is he not with us? I seem to be getting conflicting signals. Okay, um, again, uh, a few technical issues here. We're gonna move on to our next speaker um, who again is on the cutting edge of discussions on research, innovation, knowledge, and technology for which the diaspora can contribute immensely. So at this point, uh, to provide this intervention, I am going to call on uh, the distinguished John A. Hanna uh, Professor, Michigan State University and Chairman, Africa Advisory Council, United Way Worldwide Chairman, Chapel Hill Denim Management Limited, Professor Soji Adilaja. Please give him a warm, warm welcome as he joins us. Actually, not to speak about, um, well, actually, he's going to be speaking about research, innovation, knowledge, and technology. Again, please give him a warm round of applause. Professor, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, do you hear me clearly? We certainly can, and um, the platform is Chris all yours. First, let me thank the African Development Bank, the African Union, and other pioneers of this dialogue for the incredible vision and wisdom. I see this as the most decisive step in formal recognition of diaspora and talent as a critical lever in Africa's development. I'm particularly honored to be invited to provide early context for theme area four, which is research, innovation, knowledge, and technology transfer. And I'm passionate about this issue because um, as a long-term diaspora and development scholar who has also been responsible over the years for managing research systems for impact, 
as an executive dean at a major land grant university, and as a person that has been involved in Africa, either in government or in the private sector, um, I think I bring some very interesting insights to this. But one cannot do proper justice to issues related, related to Pillar 4 in just five minutes. So I'll only highlight a few points to guide our discussions later. I want to start with uh, a few facts just to set the stage for the recommendations that I will provide. First fact, many diasporans are driving in uh, the development of the countries where they reside in right now as great doctors, scientists, engineers, professors, athletes, software guru, investment bankers. And I think we should recognize that in the new global economy, place success is largely defined by its knowledge capital. So in Africa, we cannot afford this talent loss. It is eroding our competitiveness and limited, limiting the options facing future generations. As said earlier, many diasporans strongly desire to contribute to Africa. The real trick is how do you create the right incentives to optimize the engagement? We must recognize that the whole real jobs, they have huge responsibilities abroad. They are scattered across the landscape. So engaging them will require solidly creative strategies and strong platforms to drive the engagement. It does not, it's not sufficient to just simply say, we'll engage them. The great scientists I know, the great innovators I know, are not sitting on their laurels waiting to be engaged unless you have clear strategies to engage them. One of the catalytic options that we have is to incentivize existing diaspora organizations especially those that have a proven record of supporting African development to serve as conduits for their members to, um, to do work that's relevant to the African agenda. Now, my recommendations. Antonio Vittorino earlier stressed the importance of a direct view of African diasporans. I take this further by emphasizing the need for a comprehensive directory of STEM professionals in the diaspora. We need to know who they are, we need to know where they are. We need to know what they do. We need to know what their skills are and match those skills to the needs and opportunities facing Africa. I am a strong advocate for a new Africa-wide knowledge and capacity development fund to support the development of Africa's knowledge capacity. This fund should prioritize partnerships between diaspora and local researchers to build research capacity and address pressing problems facing African societies. We need to create a new African Science Foundation under the leadership of the African Development Bank and the AU. We also need strong continent-wide incentives for member nations of the AU to create their own national science foundations. These entities should prioritize partnerships between diaspora and African-based innovators to enhance STEM and development-oriented science focused on solving pressing technology problems in Africa. Number four, the AFDB should consider adopting a policy whereby countries must demonstrate strong diaspora commitment by setting aside maybe 2%, maybe 5%, maybe 10% of the proceeds from development loans for diaspora project content and for building the capacities of appropriate diaspora partnerships. Africa needs a Fulbright like special purpose scientific sabbatical exchange program in the STEM and development related fields for diasporas to contribute to capacity building in African knowledge institutions. We do need to advise donor agencies such as the USAID, DFID, COICA, JICA, GIZ to support diaspora researchers through targeted grant programs. This should focus on early stage, sorry, on non-early stage impact-oriented projects in the capacity building and economic development. We also need to recommend to our development partners and donors that they require strong diaspora content in Africa-focused development projects, just as gender mainstreaming and resilience have become critical elements of their programs. This is consistent with the new US Africa policy for example, I'd like to see USAID projects um, have very strong partnerships with African diaspora 
um, especially projects implemented by Beltway firms. Um, the field of African studies is overly concentrated on the humanities. I recommend a reset toward the strategic development agenda. Investment in fields such as business, sustainable, economic development, engineering, science and technology, IT, medicine. Decades of research on humanities and basic social sciences have not changed much in Africa. We need less research on goat count of a typical Maasai household in Kenya and more on modernizing African agriculture, industries, businesses, and universities. We need strong incentives for diaspora IT professionals to develop applications and technologies to eliminate critical bottlenecks to education, economic empowerment, and business and government processes in Africa. The FDB and AU should consider jointly championing an annual African Diaspora Award to recognize unique diaspora researchers whose work have impacted greatly on Africa's development. There is need to promote special diaspora awards in national merit awards. A lot of our countries are recognizing people and I think they should recognize the importance of this knowledge content from abroad for Africa's development. Finally, I'm recommending that we look into a simple, easy to access patent funding support program to ease the registration of innovations by diaspora and local researchers and to protect intellectual property from joint projects engaged in by diasporans and local African scientists and researchers. These are only a few of the practical things that can be done to encourage diaspora involvement. My goal is to lay the foundation for detailed discussion, which will occur later. And thank you very much. This has been a, an incredible event. Thanks. Wow, thank you very much. Please give Professor Saji Adilaja a round of applause there. The John A. Hanna Distinguished Professor of Michigan State University and the Chairman of the United Way Worldwide. Thank you very much for joining us. You've given us quite a, uh, a bit of food for thought here, a lot to unpack um, and directives to the African Development Bank, as well as African nations. In a global economy, diaspora Africans are already driving economies where they are. So we can't, it's not a fait accompli that they will actually invest or engage with Africa. They have to be provided with incentives. Again, you've given the marching orders for a comprehensive database on STEM professionals with the goal of setting up an African Knowledge Development Fund, as well as national science foundations in each country, and for the African Development Bank, setting aside two to 5% of the proceeds of development loans to again drive knowledge, research, and innovation. I like what you said about resetting the agenda and moving it away not completely, but moving away from research on humanities to scientific innovations, as well as providing an annual diaspora award. Uh, Professor Sajia Adelaja, I am sure you'll be hearing a whole lot more from the African Development Bank in this regard. Once again, thank you very much for joining us. Our final discussion on our fifth thematic um, is brain circulation, and this will be led by the director of the African Diaspora Policy Center in the Netherlands, Dr. Awil Mohammed. We want to thank you for patiently uh, being with us. You've been with us uh, since early this morning. And we're looking forward, not only to your short intervention now, but more to the in-depth session following this. I've said earlier that the brain circulation session is the one that I'm going to be logging into later on. So. Dr. Awil Mohammed, over to you. The platform is yours. There you go. We can see you. We can't hear you. So you might want to unmute. Uh, we still can't hear you. Um, try on un unmute. Uh, don't worry about that. This happens at the worst of times. We'll get to you in a few seconds. Don't worry about that. We can see you. We just need to unmute. So to the technical team in the back, 
Um, can you also check on your end to ensure that the problem isn't from the Netherlands, that it's probably also on this end? Okay, it looks like we've got you, Dr. Awil Mohamed. Sorry, I think he has the microphone issues. He, his microphone is open on Zoom, but he cannot, we cannot hear him. Okay, we'll give you a few moments, Dr. Awil Mohamed. And while you're working on that, I just want to give our audience, our worldwide audience today, an idea of what is coming on next. We've had quite a number of uh, global speakers uh, speak to us briefly, um, either by way of keynotes or short welcome addresses, goodwill addresses, as well as interventions. But we're going to be deep diving into the five thematic areas in just a few moments. These will be facilitated discussions from the floor and from the rooms and delegates will have an opportunity to contribute online or to make comments um, accordingly. So I'm gonna try and go back again to Dr. Awil Mohammed to see um, if he's been able to sort out the challenge. Dr. Awil Mohammed, um, okay, it looks like we've got a screen text, but audio wise, can you hear us? We can't hear you from this end. Unfortunately, you're not coming through at this point. Okay, just why don't you reboot and we'll come back to you in just a few uh, seconds. Um, at this point, we would like to curate questions from delegates and participants worldwide. Um, you've heard from a number of distinguished speakers today, and I'm sure they provoked certain thoughts and ideas. Uh, this is the time to send us um, your uh, comments. You'll have an opportunity to do that online, and we can feel those in the plenary, plenary sessions coming up in a few minutes. The plenary session will round out um, our session for today, and following which there will be a transition to bilateral uh, rooms immediately following. So we will give Dr. Anwil Mohammed 60 seconds to see if we can get him back online, failing which we will transition to the facilitated discussions. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so what we'll do at this point, what we'll do at this point, because we are having a few technical hitches here, uh, Dr. Anwil Mohammed, what we will do, we are going to transition at this point to the parallel sessions dealing with the five thematic areas that we've drawn out uh, today on brain circulation, research and knowledge, innovation, the securitization of remittances, diaspora bonds, and the securitization. Okay, is that you, Dr. Mohammed, or is, is that me? The wonders of technology. So at this point, we will transition. And Dr. Awil Mohammed, if you cannot um, hear us, possibly can, but we can't hear you on this end, we will transition at this point to the parallel thematic sessions. Please join us uh, for your session on brain circulation for that, as well as the other sessions. As I did mention earlier, um, when we began the summit, you already have received links to the respective sessions. Now is the time to join the session of your choice. Uh, we'll allow at least two to three minutes for you to do that before the sessions begin. Once again, to our worldwide delegates from Asia who joined us late at night, uh, North America, uh, you joined us very early in the morning, your time, to all of our delegates across Africa and Europe, and certainly to our delegates from the Caribbean. We want to say thank you very much. Join the plenary sessions coming up, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for again, a very, very robust discussion on the Diaspora Summit leveraging the soft power of the diaspora. Thank you very much once again. My name is Victor Ladukman. It's been a wonderful pleasure being your moderator.